you, you, you're a, a reconstructive and plastic surgeon. What what do you do when when you arrive in a place like Gaza after the bombardment has begun? You've done it many times. You, I know that you've worked in um, Syria, Iraq, Yemen. What do you do when you when you land when you arrive? I'm sorry, that's a simple question, but I, I I'm fascinated to know the answer. So first of all, you um, get in touch with the local team. Um, and you make yourself available according to their uh, needs. Um, as a result of doing this for now over two decades, usually um, as a result of the kind of experience and the expertise, I'm usually asked to stay in the operating room. And and um, during this war, was averaging between 10 and 12 surgeries per day. Um, these are horrific blast injuries, a shrapnel injuries and, and burns. And as a reconstructive surgeon, you're trying to um, rebuild the, the human body um, after it's been so horrendously violated by these um, injuries. And so you're, 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 hit, you're hitting the ground running. You're in the operating theater within hours, effectively, of landing in the region. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how, how did what you found when you got to Gaza compare with what you'd found, what you discovered in, in previous engagements? I think the difference is that between a, a flood and a tsunami um, in previous wars, including Mosul and, and, and Yemen and Syria, um, they were vicious and intense, but you were in control and resources were limited, but were not depleted in Gaza. The you know if you think about it the the whole n total number of beds in Gaza is two thousand five hundred beds before the war. At the moment there are sixty thousand wounded. So it kind of gives you an idea of how overwhelmed the system was, and so things were starting to run out very very quickly just from the sheer number of of the wounded and what sorts of things. From the most basic like antiseptic solutions uh, to clean the wounds to um, specialist dressings for burns, um, to uh, certain stages, f external fixators, you know, pins and, and rods for fractures. And a significant proportion of your patients were, were, were children, I think. Half of, half of, the, of the patients on a daily basis were, were kids. O on a human level, Gassan, is that different? Is it different to have a child, an infant patient, to an adult patient? Or is that a question only a non-doctor could ask? Not at all. Actually, and I could chart how, you know, my, my experience in these wars was before I had my own children to after I had my oh, own children. Gosh. As a parent, you just see your kids in each of these children. Um, and it's a much more taxing experience. Um, and I know uh, from experience, unfortunately, that each war wounded child will need between eight and 12 surgeries by the time they're of adult age because the body is trying to grow and the scarred, injured part of the body is unable to grow. And so they need repeated interventions um, throughout. Um, and presumably that's getting harder as, as the conflict continues. The, 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 the capacity, the medical capacity is diminishing as the, as the need is increasing. Absolutely. The, the, the systematic targeting of the health system, the fact that now really there's one fully functioning uh, tertiary hospital in the whole of the Gaza Strip, none in, um, uh, uh, in northern Gaza, um, means that, you know, when I spoke to my colleagues who were there last, um, they had 400 patients needing surgery um, because they're unable to cope. Um, and what happens if they don't get it? Or what happens the, the longer the delay? What, what, what's the impact of the delay? Um, wounds become infected and they become life-threatening. And this is something that we had to face uh, a lot during um, the war. Uh, what was possibly reconstructable um, becomes unreconstructable. And so limbs have to be amputated because of the delay. Uh, and I've had colleagues from MSF who are still there telling me that almost half of the amputations that they're doing now could have been fixed, could have been prevented oh. had the patients been able to get to the operating rooms in time. And so you start 
um, what we call triaging. You start selecting what you can do um, and leaving others. And you start performing procedures that you could not imagine yourself performing without anesthetic, without morphine, because you don't have any anesthetic and morphine, but the infection, especially in children, within hours can kill the child. And so you end up having to uh, take the patient um, clean the wound at least so you can buy some time because if when you go around in the morning and the child is febrile and you can smell the the infection coming through the dressings unless you've cleaned that wound by the end of the day that child is septic and probably dead I think you did 48 consecutive nights on duty yes. operating as you said yes. 10 to 12 per person so what was it hospital sleep hospital sleep Literally, uh, I would, at the end of the day, around one o'clock, I, we would clean the operating room and I'd find one of the mattresses, um, wipe it down with some disinfectant and sleep there. Um, and there were days when I wouldn't leave that room. Um, just So uh, when you're trying to kind of think of events, I think of events more than dates because yes. these kind of would merge into each other. And, and I think you survived an explosion at, at the second hospital you worked at, at Al Ali Hospital as well. Yes. Um, a missile uh, hit the hospital. The, the roof, the, the false ceiling fell on top of us. Um, and you were surrounded. I'd never experienced this where you're suddenly surrounded by the wounded and you're in the midst of it, people who had just been injured. And you're trying to prioritize which patients to try to... St- to stop the bleeding at and resuscitate and and take them to another hospital. Um, it's it's probably one of the most difficult periods of, of my career. I, I With that in mind, I, I wonder, and please don't, don't, don't answer this question if you don't want to, I wonder what you make of the way that the conflict is being covered in this country when, when, when you got back and saw the direction of, of reportage and, and the consequences perhaps of how difficult it is for journalists to get to get into Gaza and to get their stories out and, and compare what perhaps the average British consumer of news believes to be happening with what you were in the middle of. It's interesting. People now, um, especially younger people, seek their own news. Mm. They, they rarely, I mean, I can speak from my own children, they rarely watch the news. They don't watch TV, but they're informed because they're on social media looking for those uh, 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 outlets that, that they... And I think that's reflected by the support that we that there has been for a ceasefire, uh, um, an immediate ceasefire. Um, and and the hundreds of thousands have come out in demonstrations um, because people, um, people see... You see, I, I think... We're at a junction here. Um, This war, there are so many red lines that have been crossed. And that I think ordinary people recognize that if we don't apply international law now, uh, regardless of the perpetrator, regardless of the victim, um, all of the consensus that had been reached after the Second World War to, to govern Uh, the conduct of wars, whether it's international humanitarian law or even the Convention on Genocide that's just come out in the International Court of Justice, Mm. then the next war will be much worse. Then it will be acceptable to target hospitals. It will be acceptable to kill 10,000 children in the first 100 days of the war. All of these red lines that have been crossed, we know that we, unfortunately, humanity has a way of starting where it ended in the last war and any taboos that were uh, broken become the norm and become incorporated into military strategy. And I think that's one of the things that is bringing people out in droves. Well, I think also when you refer to regardless of the perpetrator, you're you're alluding to the fact that the International Criminal Court is investigating alleged war crimes committed by Israel and Hamas. Yes. On both fronts. Um, So you're describing almost the parameters moving, aren't you? The parameters of conflict reversing to a sort of pre-Geneva Convention type of scenario. Absolutely. And, and so it, it has to, we have to go back to a rules-based world where it is the act that, you know, just like the ICJ uh, ruled on the war in the Ukraine mm. and 
the uh, um, genocide in Myanmar, uh, uh, Burma. Um, it has produced a ruling on um, Israel and the plausibility that this is a genocidal war. Um, and so political expediency has eroded the rule of international law until we got ourselves to this war. And this is the stand that we need to make, um, that um, regardless of political expediency, acts that violate international law have to be uh, 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 pursued vigorously in international courts. What contact do you have when you get back with patients that you've treated or, or, or how closely, because the, the, the chaos on the ground must make it impossible almost to keep proper track of, of how they are proceeding. In a previous interview you've given, you described a, a little girl with half of her face missing who had lost her entire family and the nail polish on her toes before before they were amputated. It was impossible to read that and not, not be profoundly moved, but also impossible, I think, not to wonder what happened to her and whether you ever know. I've, I've not... I mean, people have had to move so many times. I've had to evacuate first at Shifa when that was surrounded with my patients and then Ahli when that ran out of medication. And time and again, people have had to relocate and have lost touch with so many of the wounded. And you always... You know, in those moments where it catches up with you, you wonder what happened to these kids and you know them and you remember their names and mm. you remember their faces and, and their injuries and you're, you know, you wish one day you'll be able to see them and, and, and find out what had happened. And that's why an immediate ceasefire is so important that all of these injured children need to receive the treatment that they, uh, uh, they desperately need to be able to try to limit the kind of disability that they will live with for the rest of their lives. Why do you do it? I think it gives purpose to my life in a way other work doesn't. Um, I And it becomes a kind of almost like a, you know, with each war, um, um, and then when I started pursuing this kind of work um, academically, you feel that you have more to offer and you feel that you... Um, are obliged by this set of skills that you've been given that you're obliged to be there because others will not be there. Um, and so it, as painful as it is, it gives a wealth to, to, to my life that nothing else in my life has given wealth. And in, in conclusion, the, the, the line that is used to describe what, what you're doing outside of the operating theatre and what you have done here today, it's a strange line. Gassan, isn't it? it? You're calling for a re-establishment of the rules of war. Absolutely. I mean, that's the, the because having seen this erosion, you know, we're here ha witnessing the complete destruction of the health system in Gaza because we tolerated it in Syria. We are here uh, uh, um, with over now over twelve thousand. Uh, children killed in Gaza because we uh, tolerated it in Yemen. It's that continuous erosion that has allowed, is that has gotten us as a global community, as a human race, to the point where, unless we do stop, we will be back to pre forty five uh, in the next war.